All right, let's welcome the final speaker of the conference. <laughs> uh, actually, um, Noam, you're doing the right thing. I wanted everyone to have a big plate of food because you should be only sort of half listening to my talk and kind of <laughs> munching at the same time, you know, to like stimulate your own thoughts uh, because uh, this isn't terribly well thought out. It's, uh, it's not for lack of trying, but I think it's a, a difficult subject to, to get into. And I think if you only sort of half pay attention to what I'm saying and you're eating, you know, then you'll come up with your versions. Uh, there'll be so, some kind of echoes, but they'll be smarter than what I'm telling you. Oh, oh, all right, so what, what do I want to do? I, I, I'd really like to understand what the shape of mathematics is, uh, both in the formal sense, like you know, all deductions from an axiom system uh, using some syntactical rules, that's kind of case A and case B, which is the more interesting case is human mathematics. You know, what's special within those deductions about what we actually explore. Uh, so, you know, we might take, uh, you know, some system like piano arithmetic, you know, complete with some syntactical rules so we can start uh, uh, deriving things from its axioms. Uh, or we could take you know, set theory, or maybe there are other foundations like type theory uh, that we could apply this argument to. But I want to fix a, uh, a system and think about um, all, all the consequences, uh, everything that can be proved within the system. And I think the uh, first remark to, uh, to say is that, uh, so I'll just call this math, meaning all of math, the formal side whatever version we take. Uh, I think it's good to point out that it has the structure of a hypergraph. So, you know, a graph uh, has vertices and edges, and if it's an oriented graph, then there's an arrow on the edge, so it's sort of an input and an output vertex. But, you know, math typically, um, you know, you have things like modus ponens, you have A, implies B and A is written on this line and then on this line you write B. So the deduction is really, you've gone from A implies B and A to B. And this would be an example of a hyper arc, they call it, or a hyper edge. So it has, you know, it has a valence like in this case, two, one, two inputs and one output. And you could have PQ valence, if you like. I think 2, 1 already captures what we're interested in because if you need three outputs for a conclusion, you know, you can first combine two of them with an and. So it's, you're not really exploring any new terrain. But um, uh, if you think of this hypergraph structure for developing mathematics from axioms, uh, the first thing to notice is you have explosive doubly exponential growth because you know, if uh, n is the, you know, number of starting symbols, and you, even if you only have hyper edges of, of uh, uh, type 2, 1, then in principle, you can combine any two of these. Actually, maybe you can buy, combine them in more than a single way for two of them. So roughly speaking, you have n squared outputs if you combine two at a time, and then at the next stage, you should be able to combine anything you've seen previously. So you should be able to combine one of these and one of these or two of these. But even neglecting going backwards, just combining two of these, the next thing you'd write uh, would be the square of this, would, which would be n to the fourth, then the square of this, which would be n to the eighth. So clearly, this is going like uh, n to the two to, two to the i. Yeah, so it's a double exponential kind of thing. Uh, of course, what you can write down in a number of steps is never more than expon singly exponential. You know, what's happening here is these statements perhaps are getting exp uh, exponentially uh, <clears throat> exponentially long. Uh, uh, 
uh, and doubly exponential, doubly exponential in number. So uh, an exponentially long would be if you were taking ands. Now, I think actually uh, it's really interesting to compare this hypergraph structure for all of mathematics, all of formal mathematics, with the kind of uh, graph that Pat had on the screen, which was just a directed graph, you know, all those beautiful green ovals and the arrows between them. And uh, that really does exhibit the structure of the proof of that theorem. I think it's true that if you only want to uh, keep in your database like the simplest proofs for everything you've proved, you can just work with a directed graph. Uh, so just to clarify the distinction, suppose you, know, you have uh, propositions P and Q, <clears throat> Um, and together, you know, they imply X. So this kind of hyper edge is in the graph, this sort of 2-1 hyper edge. Well, it may be that you have another proposition you previously proved R, and maybe there's a, a different hyper edge that R and Q uh, together prove X. So now you could keep it as a, a hypergraph like this, but if you try to uh, consolidate the notation in some way and just write it as EQRX and just draw it as a directed graph like this, you really wouldn't know exactly what you meant. It's not enough notation because uh, it doesn't mean that each of these separately implies X. That isn't what was meant by the green ovals and lines in Pat's graph either. And but, but so all I'm saying is, if you want to keep two different proofs of X in your database, the question already <laughs> keep the extra data of on a hyper edge of what you did to do it. Do you want to do it, Petrina, instead? Uh, I mean, uh, I'm I'm agreeing that there might be more than one uh, way of combining two statements. There might be additional parameters. Be, like if you need more than just what's on the ins and outs, but you need a little bit more. No, I, agree. I agree. You might need additional labels on the edge to say exactly how you inserted yeah. P and Q into some rule to get X. So there's a little extra data as well. True. Uh, so the, uh, the point I was trying to make is, suppose your goal is just to record everything that you can prove in the currently simplest uh, path to proving it. You know, so if you find a, a shorter proof, you are allowed to erase longer proofs that previously existed. So you could do that with a, just a directed graph, because if you had a situation like this where these two implied x and these two implied x, you could figure out in terms of length or some other metric which pair were shorter, and then uh, uh, only you know only say say these two were say this was a very long expression, then you could just uh, erase it or, or keep it keep it as a long conclusion, you know, from other things, but not not draw that line. Excuse me for saying, this is all kind of trivial stuff so far. Yeah. And, uh, yes. And, uh, and you'll, you'll no doubt be shortly saying interesting questions. And for example, Suppose there are two proofs of something. Is there a homotopy? What, what is it? Oh, no, 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 sure. A actually, um, yeah, I agree with you. This is all pretty trivial. And if your expectations is that it'll become non-trivial, I, I may be disappointing you. But um, uh, uh, actually, on the subject of disappointment, I've been reading this book called Homotopy Type Theory. <laughs> <laughs> And um, I expected it would address exactly that question because, yep. you know, I said- That's how it was advertised. What's that? That is how it was advertised. But it doesn't really. I mean- I, I, I spoke to him in 2015 about that. Oh, oh, okay. I mean, I, 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 I would love to understand, you, you, you know, piano arithmetic, you know, you start somewhere and you prove something just very schematically. And you start somewhere and you prove the same thing in a different way. You know, natural thing for a topologist to ask is what's the moves between these two paths? It's just like we always do, like, you know, to get between two drawings of a knot, you have the three Reitermeister moves to get between, 
to ways of representing uh, a knot as a braid, you know, the, the Markov moves to get between, uh, you can write any matrix, integer matrix uh, that's invertible as product of elementary matrices and the, the Steinberg moves between the different types of products. So math is full of these things where people want to analyze this. And that's what I thought this book would be about, but it isn't. So someone has to write a book about it. Uh, Oh, okay, so um, uh, so I, th this was trivial, and it's just uh, this is this like unbelievably complicated triviality of what all formal mathematics is, and then we have uh, you know what what humans do, and I, that's really what I want to focus on. Uh, so one idea is that maybe in this huge space of mathematics, formal mathematics. There's this like thin human part. And you know, what could characterize this? So I, I, I want to take a couple approaches. Uh, anything that can be derived, anything that can be proved, I wonder if we could try to assign some interest to it without um, using human supervision automated way to approximate the notion of interest of the statement. Yes, Jesse. Yeah. Jared, um, Jared, sorry. Uh, yeah. If you think about, you know, this graph, I have a graph you talk about uh, how central of a node, uh, how many neighbors it has. Uh, you can think of maybe even iterating this process by how... Drink. Drink. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm about to say something like that. Yeah, but um, even before we start with like how central is the node and how much do other things depend on it, uh, I'd like to make a first cut uh, at interest, how, how interested we are in it. And because this is just a first cut, I want to call it interest at level zero. And what I'd like to suggest is it's the um, uh, the length of the shortest proof. Divided by the length of the statement. And I think in math, we're often surprised by nice kind of condensed statements that are difficult to prove nevertheless, like Fermat's last theorem. Now, I mentioned this a year ago to Mike Douglas, and he said, well, the busy beaver function will very quickly make a mockery of such a definition. So I want to explain uh, his insight there and actually maybe put even more meat on it. Yeah, yes. Um, so when you say first proof, sorry, are you um, assuming that you have potentially uh, complicated definitions within that proof? Yeah, or are you very, expanding very, everything very, out? Very, very good. Let's think on machine. I, the nested definitional structure of mathematics is something I definitely want to come to in quickly. But for right now, let's just think in machine language. We'll write numerator, denominator, just all out brutally. Uh, so so let me just remind you about this busy beaver function. Uh, Busy beaver of n as you consider all possible n state Turing machines, and you throw away the ones that uh, run forever on a blank tape input, and then the ones that halt, you take uh, how, how many steps until they halt, and the maximum that's busy beaver of n. And it's known that uh, I think the last one that's been computed, and it's only very recently, I read about it in an Aronson, Aronson's blog. Busy beaver of five is about, or is roughly 50 million. And then uh, I think they know that busy beaver of six has to be at least as large as, and now this is what's called a fifth level function, something in recursive function theory like plus is level zero or one, and times is the next level two, and then exponentiation is three, and then you know, it's one of these two variable functions that has the level. It's like Ackerman function kind of thing. I don't even know how to define it. I can't remember. But anyway, it's some ungodly thing. So it's a, it, it, busy beaver grows very fast. And one might guess 
<clears throat> that a statement like this, that Busy Beaver of Five is greater than 50 million, this is a rather concise statement, so it would have a uh, very short statement length. But one might guess that the proof is uh, takes longer than 50 million steps because no one really knows any way of uh, doing these things except running the machines. Now, um, I actually had an email conversation with Aronson and uh, 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 Elliot Glazer <clears throat> and uh, came up a, a theorem I think Sam Buss identified for us. There's a theorem of Pavel Pavlik. Good luck. Which says that in any um, fairly powerful system, like PA or ZFV, a proof, this is his theorem, a, a proof of what's called K consistency uh, must have length um, greater than or equal to O of uh, square root of K. So K consistency means that for piano arithmetic would say, say that um, there's no proof that, um, so K consistency means that uh, any proof that zero equals one must can, uh, be of length K. You have to write down K symbols to prove that uh, zero equals one. So obviously K consistency is weaker than consistency. Consistency is consistency for all K. Now you can obviously prove K consistency in like uh, E to the K or E to the constant K steps because you can just try everything you could write and see if it's a proof. Uh, so that's an upper bound to how long it would take. Okay. But this is <clears throat> a lower bound. That's what makes it an interesting theorem. That you can't prove it so so quickly. So we can find it a, something that provably uh, has a large ratio, uh, but probably is not that interesting. And the statement would be that um, uh, uh, PA or is now we'll put in a number for K. We could put in busy beaver of uh, constant times m squared consistent. Now, we all believe this is true. We believe that, I mean, th this statement of public is based on the assumption that the system is consistent only. Otherwise, there could be very short proofs. So this is an example of uh, a theorem that we are uh, essentially certain is true, uh, but uh, it would get a very high score. So uh, this naive idea sort of, you know, maybe breaks down when it meets the brunt of recursive function theory and self-reference and all that. 